Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Karen Card, and welcome to week four, lesson four, and we want Wisdom's Image um, is our lesson uh, this week, and we want to uh, go on into the Word of God. I thank you for tuning in and listening to our pre-recorded class. Uh, I know it's a little bit different than what we're used to, what I'm used to, but I hope you're getting uh, a lot out of this semester's uh, course, the uh, Wisdom of Proverbs. It's thrilling my soul. And uh, we just want to go ahead and get on into the Word of God so we have plenty of time. And thank you for your patience and thank you for your understanding uh, with our trying new things and appreciate your diligence in getting your lessons done on time uh, for making uh, Southwest Georgia Theological Seminary a priority in your life and your studies in the Word of God a priority in your life. I know that it will bless you and it's um, it's a path of wisdom. I really think that it is. I think that it's wise to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And as we dive into the Scriptures, we are always ever reaching for uh, that position of rightly dividing the word of truth. We obviously do not want to be in error. We do not want to lead, be led away or lead anyone away from the foundational truths of the word of God. So wisdom is the principal thing. And with all our getting, we want to get understanding. So this week, as we look at uh, lesson four and we look at wisdom's image and we asked ourselves, what does wisdom look like? And obviously, it, I guess it would depend on who you asked what they thought wisdom looked like. Some people are lured to wisdom that James described in James chapter 1 that was earthly, sensual, and devilish. That was from beneath, and it wasn't the wisdom that was from above. So we definitely don't want to uh, walk in a path of wisdom that is uh, sneaky that's uh, full of flattery, that's full of uh, in pleasing people-pleasing uh, ide ideology. We want to know wisdom and, and have discretion and have justice and judgment and equity and the righteousness and all, all of the things that true wisdom can bring. And we have been learning that true wisdom comes from God and it begins with the fear of the Lord. It begins with the fear of God. So we have to say, so what does wisdom look like? And and I have to bring out here that in, in the book of Proverbs and, and other places, but especially in the book of Proverbs, we the first mention of the word wisdom, it uses the Hebrew word hakmah. Now, in, in our study, there may be a, a, a slight variation on how the Hebrew word hakmah is transliterated. Now transliteration is the ability to take a word in another language and give it the phonetic sounds of how we would pronounce it close to it in English. So if the spelling variations are different just a little bit, hopefully you can still come to the pronunciation of Hakma. Hakma it, it means wisdom and it means being wise. And so what does that look like? We said it wasn't earthly, sensual, or devilish. It wasn't a, an alluring, sensual, devilishly fiendish, uh, like Satan was subtle in the Garden of Eden and began to beguile Eve and, and later caused Adam to fall in transgression. That beguiling, whispering, sneaky, <laughs> Uh, illusionary voice, you know, Satan, that wants to lead us into temptation. But as the Lord's Prayer was, and some people don't even pray that part, but you need to pray it every day, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. So that has to be in our mind as we're looking at wisdom's uh, image and what wisdom looks like, because there's other, other voices that are lifting up their cry to us, those that are simple those that have need of wisdom and understanding. The same people who, who need wisdom's instruction that needs the voice of wisdom and the person of wisdom uh, in their life 
and the teachings of wisdom, the instructions of wisdom, the words of the wise, and their dark sayings, and the proverbs, and discretion, and justice, and judgment, and equity, and just all that good stuff. The same people who need that are also the ones that other voices are beckoning to. Now, in Proverbs chapter 7 through 9, we get some personification going on into the characteristics of both wisdom and the strange woman. Later, in, a, in another lesson later on in the semester, we'll talk more, maybe more in depth about the strange woman because there's some things that, 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 I, that I feel about it. But uh, know this, that, that it's, you, it's kind of like you've received two dinner invitations. You've received a dinner invitation uh, someone that wants you to come and spend time with them and get them to know know you. And one of them is Lady Wisdom Hakma, and uh, who is righteous and virtuous and good and was with God in the beginning. Uh, and then you have the the strange woman. You have the personification of the voice of temptation, the voice of sexual immorality, the voice and the beckonings to to lust and to sin and to follow them down the path of temptation. And so you've got these two, and both personified as women, that, that allure uh, and the, uh, the same kind of a, the teaching that this fatherly discourses give us that when they say, my son, and uh, teaching the young, you know, don't be led astray by strange, flattering women, women that want to allure you, that their goal is to allure you to their bed. And their goal is to trap you in their house, not realizing that their their house leads to death and to hell. And we need to know that. We need to tell people again that beckoning and that alluring and that earthly, sensual, devilish call that is that is standing in the same place, really, that wisdom would stand. That place at, at, at like a crossroad in the street, a place where... Uh, an intersection is where you've got to make the decision between right or wrong, where right is beckoning to you and wrong is beckoning to you. So in, in Proverbs 7, it begins in verse 1, it says, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers and write them upon the table of thine heart. Say to wisdom, thou art my sister, you're my kinswoman. He's saying well, here, this sister, this affection, you're my kinswoman. Uh, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman and from the stranger which flattereth with her words. And that, that beckoning and that call. If, if we align ourselves within a familiar, a family relationship, if you will, close kinship relationship with wisdom, uh, that we're, we're tight. Mean wisdom are tight, and don't make room for the strange woman to entice thee, and that flatters with her words. So uh, this this is a continuation of the pill, even that was in chapter six, the end of the chapter. Uh, chapter seven uh, brings uh, again, as it was, the commandment back to a, a, a foreplay that that wisdom uh, wisdom would say, keep his commandments and live as as. The voice here says, my son, keep my commandments and live. Keep it as the apple of your eye. You know, uh, bind them on your fingers and write them on the table of your heart. Say to wisdom, you're my sister. And, and say to understanding, you're my kinswoman. Oh, how close that is. How, how tight that is. And now look, most, most young men, even a lot of crazies that goes on today, uh, if you're you're thick with your family and good with your family and your grandma and your aunt or your sister is watching you, you're not going to stand there and, and tie up in the road with a, a loose woman. You know, I'm not going to get vulgar about it, but y'all can put your own words in there. You know, they, they may do it in the dark. They may do it down the road. They may uh, slip a message with their eye and wink with their eye and say, you know, I'll catch up with you later. But you're not going to do it right in the face of wisdom. You're not going to do it right in the face. Most of the time, people start out by sneaking around uh, in that kind of living, in that kind of lifestyle. They're, they're slipping around. They don't want their mama to know. They don't want their 
you know, their grandma to know. They don't want their sisters to know. They don't want their, uh, you know, their close cousins or close with to know that they're, you know, meeting up with that harlot, that they're meeting up with that married woman, that they've got a liaison plan with somebody else's wife. So this is kind of the analogy that is being played out here when we're reading the end of chapter 6 and going to chapter 7. And so you get this invitation, uh, and you, you've been, as it was in, in chapter 6, this married woman has allured this simple young man and said, I have, uh, let me show you my bed. Let me show you my bed and all the delights that I can offer you in my bed. And I thought it's so crazy because in, in chapter 8 and in chapter 9, uh, Lady Hakma, who is a true lady, and, you know, she's not, she's not a harlot. She's not an adulterous woman. She's not a loose woman. She's not the strange woman. She is, she is the personification of wisdom. And so we're looking at what she looks like and what she has to offer. And she offers a description of her table that is spread. She offers a description of the house that she is building or has built. And uh, not just a description of come see my bed. And, but come see the house I built. And in another proverb, it, the, the scripture says that a foolish woman will tear down her own house with her own two hands. But a wise woman will build her house. And of course, Proverbs 31 woman will, will definitely, by the end of spring semester next year, we're going we're gonna to do it up right, you know, as we get into the... Uh, the uh, virtuous woman that's mentioned in Proverbs 31. But Lady Hakma herself is a lady. She is a gentle woman, if you will. She is a kinsman. She is a sister. It is a virtuous relationship. It is a godly relationship. It's not an immoral, fornicating, adulterous relationship. It's not something we have to hide. Our relationship with wisdom can be on display. Now you think about the comparison between the strange woman who's beckoning the simple, those who need wisdom, those who need instruction, those who need discipline, those who need the chastening hand of God, those who need to learn to be a disciple. Uh, the strange woman and wisdom herself are both beckoning. They're both calling. And the, the question, the $25,000 question, as they say, is whose voice are you going to listen to? Whose voice, what voice of reason are you going to listen to? I hope it's Lady Hawkmark. Because look at the comparison between the strange woman who her main fault, her main uh, thrust, is to show you her bed. And relationships in the natural world and um, natural relationships, men and women relationships, human relationships, and especially in, in men and women, young men, young women, uh, single women, married women, married men, single men, when an individual, whether you're male or female, when when all they really want you to know about them is their bed, you need to back up. When all they can brag about, and you, you read chapter 7, you'll see what I'm saying. All, all that she could brag about was her bed. And uh, she was so proud. Uh, she was, it's like the foolish woman. She's standing, she's looking out of her window, you know. She's looking out the window and she sees the simple coming. And uh, see the young men and knew that they were void of understanding. You don't think the devil don't know? You ain't got to listen. You think the devil don't know that you have yet to come under the disciplining hand of God? That you are still kind of playing with, with your soul? You're still kind of playing around? A lot of people, they're raised in church. They, young people go through a thing and they're like, you know, I'll settle down. And I'll get serious later. I'm going to live a little bit. I want to experience a little bit of life. I, I want to know what's what. I want to know what's going on. I'm going to end up back in church. I know I'm going to end up back in church. I mean, I hear it all the time. I see it all the time. I'll be coming back. You know, Sister Karen, I'll be coming back. And, and no doubt they have ever, ever intention to come back. But sometimes the path that people take into the house of the, of, of the strange woman leads to hell and to death. And there's no coming back. There's no recovery. There's drug addicts who had every intention at some point of getting clean and getting free. And some point of being the son, the daughter, the, the wife, the husband, the brother, the sister, the friend that they knew that they should be. But an overdose takes them out of this life. Their heart immediately stops. They're gone. 
No chance to recover. No chance to return. No chance to repent. God help us. Look, the strange woman is looking out her window, waiting for the opportunity to accost someone void of understanding. Passing through the street near her corner, on the way to her house, in the twilight and evening, in the black and the dark of night. Uh, and the, the young metal woman there with the attire of a harlot. No cover up, no pretending she looked like a harlot. I will have to tell you that I don't think God's women ought to look like harlots. I don't think we have any business putting on the attire of a harlot to snare somebody, to trap somebody. We, you know, we want to we wanna do like the world does and just like, mm, all this, you know. Come on, y'all. We can do better than that. We're supposed to be spirit-filled women of God, spirit-filled daughters of the Most High God. We can do better than that. I'm not saying you got to put a sack on it. You don't. And what you, how you dress for your husband in your house is your own business. I'm not getting in that. I'm not going there. But I do think that godly men and godly women ought to have the attire of godliness on them, inside and out. I believe that. Not going to change my mind. But it is, it is how I believe. It's how I feel. So, so we're looking at this. She has the attire of a harlot. She's subtle of heart. She's loud and stubborn, and her feet will not abide in her own house, although she has a house. She has a husband, but she is an adulterous woman, and uh, she's lying in wait on every corner, so she catches a young man and kisses him, and makes an impotent face at him and says, I've made peace offerings. I've paid my vows this day, and I've come forth to meet you. I wanted to seek the face, and now I've found him. She's looking for a lover. She's been to the idol's house. She's been to the house of idolatry, to the house of the, the goddess of love, lovers and for, fertility and immoral sex, and asked for a blessing, asked to catch a lover, asked to be blessed with someone that, that she wants to snare and that will satisfy her lust. She asked for that, and I'll ask offered an offering, and that's what they did. Old Testament times, they went to the idol house, and they sought for a blessing uh, in, in sexual immorality. Now, you think about that. I, I'm going to the house of God. Lord, help me. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil, aren't you? Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. We want to be free from it. So his, her husband's not home. She's gone on a long journey, and she promises something very inviting and secret and subtle and alluring to this young, simple person. So she sacrificed, and she said, you've got to, you're meant for me. Come to my bed. Come see my bed. Uh, so this woman offers her bed. This, this strange woman, strange doctrine, strange spirits. I'm going to tell you, a lot of times, if people get fall in immorality, fall in sexual immorality, fall in uh, stealing money, stealing offerings, you know, taking money off the top that they shouldn't be taking, whatever terminology you want to put on it, they, whatever trap that they've got into, and they remain in that, and they don't repent, and they don't ask for deliverance, it's going to get to be a bigger stronghold. Because fornication, adultery, uh, those are they those are uh, works of the flesh. They're listed in Galatians chapter 5, they're, and they're the works of the flesh. And I'm here to tell you that works of the flesh that remain active in your life, and you're not actively seeking to uh, lay aside the works of the flesh. They will become strongholds. They will become demonic strongholds in your life. And it will be harder and harder and harder and harder to break the, the bondage that you fall into. People who are in, um, in a, a spirit, in fornication and adultery often fall into that sin over and over and over and over again. It, it's got like a chokehold on them, and it's like they cannot get free, or they will not get free. And I tell you, a good dose of the fear of God that come on somebody, you tell them that you're really in danger of hellfire, and don't talk them out of it. Don't say, okay, you prayed when you're five, you're good to go. You're living in sin, you're living in adultery, and I'm here to tell you that that stuff that's unrepented of, and un you're unregenerated in that area of your life, it's going to become a demonic stronghold. But God help us that these things can be broken. And that 
spirit offers those relationships. There are relationships out there that all they're offering you is the bed. Uh, there are sometimes men. I know we put a lot on women here tonight because Proverbs is using the personification of women. But there, there are men out there that their allurement to women is what they can offer in the bed. Their, their uh, claim to fame, if you will, is that is their bed. Uh, they don't offer stability. They don't offer security. They don't offer protection. They don't offer their name. They don't offer a godly relationship. All they present is their bed. So there's a litmus test for you. You're, in, you're, you're being lured, kind of smiled at and flirted with, with a come-hither relationship. Maybe you have a right to be in a relationship. Maybe you're single and you're looking for a, a mate. You're looking for a, a man or a woman to live with. To build a life with. Can I tell you that you cannot have a foundation. You will not have a home. You will not have a house. When the only function. Whether it's male or female. And claim to fame is the tie to the bed. House is more than the bed. House is more than the bed. And the first, So I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that. I think I made my point. Uh, that uh, There's a lot, a lot of allurement to relationships out there. And all they're offering is a bed. And I'll tell you a religion that only offers you feel-good stuff and doesn't lead you to repentance, that doesn't lead you to godliness, that doesn't lead you to discipleship, that is, a, that is a relationship that's only offering you gratification of your flesh. Fix my problems. Fix, fix me. Fix me, Jesus. He will fix us. He will fix us. But, but we, we're offering up our life. We're offering up to him. We're presenting our body a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable, which is our reasonable service. And to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we improve what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's what I want. Don't you want that? I want, so the opposite of that, the direct opposite of that is, is the call for wisdom who says, who presents her table, who presents her house. So you. So the question was asked: What what does wisdom look like? What what is uh, wisdom's image? So so how can you know? Can we tell what wisdom looks like by defining her character in this way? That instead of just offering a bed, momentary pleasures, quick fixes, she offers a home. She offers a, a home that has seven pillars. It's got a foundation. I don't you want to be in a relationship? You know, years ago, years and years ago, women, um, by remaining virtuous before marriage and not living in promiscuity, uh, forced men to live virtuous as well as possible, and said, "You're going to put a ring on my finger. You're not coming to my bed." This relationship is going to be more about more than just our bed. Because Corinthians, Paul said that the marriage bed is honorable and all. It's undefiled. It's honorable and all. But the whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And that fornication, he said, if you give to fornication, you're destroying your own body. You're, you're tearing down your house before you can ever build it. So we're interested in building a, a spiritual house. Uh, we're, I'm actually interested in living in a house that wisdom's built. So let me go on what wisdom looks like. Now, wisdom, uh, there's, uh, wisdom is, has preeminence. So we've, we've quoted it. The Proverbs 4 and 7, 7 says that wisdom is the principal thing. And with all thy getting, get understanding. So wisdom does have a preeminence. Wisdom sits up high. Wisdom is not low. It's not base. It's not demeaning. It's not insulting. It's not disrespectful. Wisdom is very respectful and very virtuous. And uh, I like those words. And wisdom is referred to as a she. Um, you know, of course, you know, Jim made the mention here that uh, Solomon had 300 wives and 700, 800 concubines. So he said he thought about women a lot. So uh, women are very prominent in Proverbs, as we've been talking about and men mentioning that. But wisdom uh, is, is like illustrated or personified uh, 21 times. Uh, wisdom is referred to as a she. 
in Proverbs alone. And, it, and in our study, it gives it lists those verses. And it's also referred to as her and herself 23 times in Proverbs. And it lists those, uh, those different things. So wisdom uh, is referred to as she at least 21 times in the book of Proverbs alone. And wisdom uh, is, is also referred to as her and herself. 23 times. That's a lot of times in, in just that one book for wisdom to be personified as a she. So uh, there's analogies that go with wisdom that she has, a, as we mentioned, a well-run house. Proverbs 9 and 1, uh, let's look at that. I like want to look at the scriptures themselves. And so just for a second, I want to look at this verse, Proverbs 9 and 1. It says, wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beast. She has mingled her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has set forth her maidens and crieth upon in the high places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wants understanding, she says to him, Come, eat of my bread and drink of, drink of the wine which I have mingled. Uh, forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. So automatically it says here, that wisdom is not trying to tear down her own house and try to destroy her own dwelling place, but she has builded her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars, which represents a foundation. Because in those days, as is now as well, uh, if you want to live in a good house, you want to live in a strong house, and um, we've been facing storms and been facing, you know, uncertainties. Florida was, you know, bombarded. And oftentimes we face storms and tornadoes in this area, in our neck of the woods. And, and so many times, and you're like, they tell you, if you're living in a mobile home, you know, go somewhere safer. Uh, you know, go somewhere where there's a stronger foundation. Go somewhere where there's maybe an underground basement or a bunker somewhere that if the wind takes everything that's on the top layer off, you can be safe underneath. It, that is wisdom. Wisdom would say, go to a house that has seven pillars. Go to a house that has foundations. Uh, we mentioned a few weeks ago that Solomon, when he built the temple of the Lord, and it took him seven years to build the temple of the Lord, and some said this analogy, the seven pillars, was those seven years. Maybe. I don't know. But, uh, but it's talking about something with a solid foundation, a good foundation. And, and we should want our homes. We should want our homes to have a good foundation, not just naturally speaking, but spiritually speaking and morally speaking and, and in love and in harmony and peace. Those are good foundations for a home, for a happy home, a happy life. If, if people that are living in your house are fornicating and commit adultery and running around and cheating and breaking their vows, that's not a happy home. That is not a home with a good foundation. There are no seven pillars there. Uh, they, they offer a bed only. And um, we want more than that. I, I want to live in wisdom's house. I, I want to have the security that those seven pillars could offer me. And I want to eat at wisdom's table. And <laughs> well, that gets me on a great subject that I love to talk about, which is the table of the Lord. I love to talk about how the, in, the, in throughout the Bible that, uh, that the communion table, that a relationship table, one pastor I knew said a supping table, a relationship, uh, a relationship where Jesus said in Revelation 3 and 20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. That, that relationship of communion, like Melchizedek, when he met Abraham after the slaughter of the kings in Genesis 14, brought forth bread and wine. Um, just from the beginning, when Abraham was dwelling in the tents in the plain of memory and that two angels of the Lord and the Lord himself, a pre-incarnate manifestation of the Lord, came to Abraham there in the, in the plains of memory and visited him. And the angels kept going to Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Lord spoke and said, according to the time of life, soon Sarah is going to bring forth a son. And Sarah's in her tent laughing. She snickered and laughed. Oh, my God. That's so funny. And then the Lord said, why would you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. <laughs> she did. She laughed. She, she just laughed. But the Lord visited them there, you know, and, and uh, communed with them and and so often I think about the, the table of the Lord and how that in Psalm 23 said the Lord prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So I'm like, okay, we're talking about the table of the Lord. And in the, in the tabernacle, we have the table showbread that 
the bread, the unleavened bread was placed fresh and new weekly. It was anointed with oil, anointed with frankincense, anointed with that holy anointing oil. And the priest, the high priest and his family and, and those priests that they're in that sanctuary in that holy place right before the veil right before the ark of the covenant they ate that bread in that holy place and how that even david you know when they ate with the showbread how you know did something to him you know those those vagabonds and those uh, depressed and discouraged and distressed and in debt individuals became mighty men you know and oh my god you know the Beathar said there's bimelech said there's nothing here but the showbread but uh Anyway, they, and, but they were hungry and they fed them with that showbread. And it's, it's just a powerful, it's throughout the Bible, throughout the Bible. And in the Gospels, Jesus, he sat down at a Pharisee's table. The Pharisee said, come eat with me. You know, I don't really know why I invited Jesus. Because when Jesus got there, uh, Jesus' own testimony was he didn't give him any water to wash his feet. He didn't give him any water to wash his hands or his face. He didn't give him any oil to on his head or any refreshment having walked there in the dusty roads. Uh, he didn't. There was no personal interchange of washing feet and communing on that kind of a level between Jesus and Simon the Pharisee. But the woman who uh, the Bible said was a sinner came in and she stood behind Jesus and she began to weep. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and then to dry his feet with the hair of her head. Jesus said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon said, say on. I'm listening. But was he really? So he told me, he said, this, this woman who, who was a sinner said she loves much. She, for, she was forgiven much and she loves much. And, and really uh, came to the conclusion or left the conclusion for Simon is that you don't love much. You don't even really respect me. You don't even really appreciate me, much less love me. And, and, and how highly the Lord spoke of the woman in another place, Jesus was anointed by another woman, a place, and Judas Iscariot, in his heart, said, "This, what a waste this was. All that expensive perfume, she just broke it up and poured it on his feet. We could have sold that perfume for a lot of money. And, you know, he cared about the money because he carried the bag, is what Scripture tells us. And commented that her worship, that her act of lavishly pouring that oil on the Lord was a waste. That was at a table experience. The Last Supper was a table experience. The fish and the bread baked on the coals of fire after the resurrection, that was a table experience. Um, and, and definitely our communion, the communion that we are to partake of as, as Christians, the, the bread and the wine to do in remembrance of him as the early church went from house to house breaking bread and having prayer and fellowship one with another, continuing steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and in prayer. They, uh, they broke bread together. They had communion together. We're called to communion. We're called to a table, to a supping relationship. So I love the fact, now the strange woman, all she has to offer is the bed. All she has to offer is allurement. All she has to offer is enticements and carnal pleasures and, and quick fixes. And, but their wisdom has a house built. Wisdom has a table set. And wisdom says, come eat of my bread and drink of my wine, which was a communing if you will, offering, a, com a, a representation of communion and uh, real fellowship and a, and a house that's solid and a house that's secure. Oh, Lord. So, yeah, this is this is what wisdom has a well-run house and a, a well-prepared table. She has a meat source and a drink source. It's a very furnished table. It's an inviting table, well well advertised. She sends her servants out. We're not doing this in secret. The strange woman was in the dark of the night and undercover and behind the bushes, so to speak, and sneak and allure and, and, and in darkness and, and, and being tempted. But wisdom goes, sends her maidens out into the streets and lifts up her voice in the high places and beckons. You can come in here. This is an open, honest relationship. This is a godly relationship. This is a relationship that won't bring you any harm. Praise the Lord. And it's welcome to all, the simple, and to him that lacks understanding. Wisdom's calling for you tonight. If you lack wisdom, wherever the areas are, you say, oh, I'm okay. I don't. And so many times we seek for wisdom when we need direction. I don't know which way to go. But you know what? We need wisdom in so many areas of our life. We're going to get into these studies 
throughout Proverbs and stuff that the absolute areas, it's, it's astounding, where wisdom wants to speak to us. Wisdom would speak to us in our finances. Wisdom would speak to us in our relationships. Wisdom would speak to us how we treat one another and about lending and borrowing. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on. We need wisdom. Children of God, we need wisdom. We might as well own up to it. We might as well confess it. We might as well ask God for it. If any man lack wisdom, go ahead and tell yourself, I lack wisdom. There's some areas that I really need wisdom in. I do. There's some things I've been praying about. This, this course of study is prompting me in prayer about wisdom. And there are some specific, specific areas of wisdom that I'm asking the Lord to help me with. Um, just like we, uh, there's times I, we talk about, the New Testament talks about we've been made stewards of the manifold grace of God. That word manifold means multifaceted. And I have found out, the Lord spoke to the apostle there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient. And there's sometimes I need such diverse manifestations of grace. <laughs> and I said, oh my God. And one time I remember three times in a week I had a, I had a flat, I had flat tires. I don't know what was going on in my car. My, my son Joseph was a little boy. I think he was in pre-K or kindergarten at that time. And, and it, it, it was happening in the morning when we were going to school. And he just, on that last third flat tire, he just started screaming in the back seat, started hollering and crying. He, he was sick of flat tires, and he was tired of the flat tires, and he was worried about it. Thought that every day we were going to have flat. Tires. I felt the same way. I was getting, I was getting the jack out of the trunk, and uh, again trying to uh, do something about that flat tire. And I, I just, I felt I did what Joseph did. I started crying. Husband wasn't around. He was working in making. He wasn't in town. And I, oh my God! And I started praying for flat tire grace. At that moment in time, I didn't care how weird it sounded. I didn't care how ridiculous it sounded. I didn't care if it seemed far-fetched or if people thought I was losing some marbles or screws. But I needed and wanted flat tire grace because I, I had went my last mile with those tires. <laughs> and I'll tell you, God, God moved for me in a mighty way. God blessed me by the end of that weekend. I, God gave me four new, brand new tires. And that's how many know when your children are small and you're pinching every penny that you can get your hands on. Sometimes getting new tires is a battle. Anyway, it was that week. But anyway, God came through and he gave me flat tire grace. So what, what grace do you need? What wisdom do you need? I Financial wisdom. I think that in the hour that we live in, we all could use more financial wisdom. God give us financial win wisdom. How to handle our finances in an economy that it, uh, groceries is three times the price that it used to be. And uh, electric bills you know, four, five hundred, six hundred dollars, the gas prices. I mean, and we're still trying to live in a, in a, in a society that, that flaunts abundance and uh, opulence and, and a, a lifestyle that we, we can't afford. We need financial wisdom. We need wisdom and discretion. The church needs wisdom in its dealings with the world. Uh, we need wisdom for in relationships. We need wisdom uh, of time management wisdom. We need wisdom for how to study the scriptures. We need wisdom on how to reach the lost. The Bible said, he that winneth souls is wise. God knows we need wisdom in this area in order to be able to, to uh, reach the lost in that. We need wisdom on how to get church folks to come back to church. We need wisdom on how to be the church in, an, in a time and an and a era in which we've never passed this way before. We're like the children of Israel when they came out of the wilderness and they were getting ready, right, crossing over the river Jordan on into the promised land. And they said, y'all better keep your eyes on the Ark of the Covenant. You better keep your eyes on that Ark and don't, don't stray, don't get your eyes off the Lord because you've never been this way before. And so we've never been this way before. The church has never went this way particularly before. We've never lived in the time in which we're living in the atmosphere of Antichrist and the Spirit. And John said that the Spirit of Antichrist worked in that day in the first church. How much stronger is that Antichrist Spirit in the hour in which we live? That It's like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and like the days of Noah. We know that that Antichrist Spirit is working. And so, God, we need wisdom. 
God, we need wisdom. God, we need understanding. We need it worse than we've ever needed it before. But wisdom is welcoming to all. And wisdom exhorts all that will come to her table to embrace women. She says, come and eat my bread and drink my wine. Forsake the foolish and live. Go in the way of understanding. Uh, and Proverbs 18 and 4 describes wisdom as a wellspring of a flowing brook. It's like rivers of living water. Wisdom is like a flowing brook. It's a picture. Uh, the, the picture is of activity and life-giving potential that's free from pollution and free from uh, from uh, mud and sediment. That it's uh, it's it's like the water that's at the top of Graveyard Falls up there on the. Uh, in the Pisgah National Forest went up on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Okay, there, there is a uh, hiking area, and it's called Graveyard Fields. And at the top of the mountain there, uh, in, at the fields there, and it was a scene of a, a battle, a uh, Civil War battle, uh, but it was uh, at the top there, there is a, uh, a, uh, a babbling brook of water is a fountainhead, if you will, water that cascades down into a natural waterfall. And at the bottom there, people will go up there, that water is ice cold in the middle of July. I don't care how hot it is, if you put your feet or your hands or any part of your body in that water, you have stepped into ice water, coldest water. And I mean, there's cold water all over the mountains of Western North Carolina, but this is one of them. And uh, we've hiked there, and my family always enjoyed that. And the last time that I was actually at Graveyard Fields was actually in June, um, uh, the end of June in 2018. It's been a minute since I've been able to be up there. But in order to get to the bottom where the pool is there, and it, and it goes on further down, way down the mountain. It travels way, way, way down the mountain. And there, though, where it makes its first stop with the flowing water down over the the waterfall there, it is so beautiful. And it is an area where people can get in there and swim. Oh my God, people's lips are turning blue and their teeth are chattering and they're quivering and can't stop. And oh, I'm okay. <laughs> teeth are chattering. Oh my God. But I was up there and I was at the top there. Went down there where they were swimming. I was up there at the top and that water was so clear. And we was on the very top of the mountain, on the very top of the mountain. So this water is clear and it's clean and it's pure and it's cold. And I couldn't help myself, but I reached my hands, cut my hands and got down on my knees and just began to drink from that ice cold flowing water. That's what I think of when I think of wisdom. I can't help it. Y'all, there's some town, sometimes down here in this hot South Georgia, the one thing that I get to miss and sometimes more than anything, besides those cool mountain breezes, uh, besides waking up at three o'clock in the morning with the window open and just ugh, feeling a chill, the mountain air is so refreshing. It's the water. It's it's the water. When I, when I raised up outside of Asheville in a little community called Barnardsville, and my family had uh, land, an own land out there. And there were uh, s several natural springs there that just, you know, come up out of the ground, come out the side of the mountain. You could tap into the water if you tap straight into the rock. Uh, on my dad's land, and my grandfather owned it at the time, and he uh, he put a pipe in into the rock, and and water just came out of it all the time, just like a living faucet, no pump, you know, no well, just straight out of the rock. That water was so good it was so cold so refreshing and especially in the days we've ex we experienced down here in summer june july and august and it's so hot it's like living on the equator there's something inside of me i'm like oh my god i'm like david if i could have a cup of water from the well of bethlehem the well there it's at the gate of bethlehem i'm dying for a drink of that water and uh lord them, those fellows that brought that water back to him they did it at the peril of their own life they went through enemy lines and secured the cup of water and brought it back to david and he poured it out before the lord he said only the lord is worthy of a water that could have cost these people their life only the lord is worthy of that kind of good drinking water. So wisdom is like this flowing, amen, water, amen. My God, I praise the Lord for that. And I, a flowing brook of water. So picture that, you know, uh, 
No, no impurities, no sediments, no pollution. It's not muddied up. It's not uh, polluted water by the feet in the, of men or beasts or animals. It's clean, pure, living water. Praise the Lord. Wisdom is really offering us something great. So wisdom's at attributes, this picture that we've painted for you in these attributes, this personification of Hakmah. All her words are righteous. Nothing forward or perverse rests in her mouth. Proverbs 8 and 8. Her words are plain and right to those that would find knowledge. Proverbs 8 and 9. Wisdom dwells with prudence and finds out knowledge of witty inventions. Proverbs 8 and 12. Wisdom is understanding. 8 and 14. If sought early, speaking of wisdom, she will be found. Proverbs 8 and 17. We can't really, we should not wait to the end of our life to look for wisdom. We should continue seeking wisdom, absolutely. But th this personification of wisdom is something, and Solomon said this in Ecclesiastes, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth before the evil days come. Something about seeking for wisdom early. So let's don't use it as a last resort. Let's do it early. Her fruit is better than gold and her revenue than choice silver, Proverbs 8 and 19. And there's reading assignments here that's given uh, for this lesson that goes, goes along with uh, bringing out the uh, wisdom's image and what wisdom looks like and just exactly who Lady Hakma is. Uh, you know, God, God be with us. God help us and, and God give us everything. You know, and as we... Uh, said whosoever finds you know wisdom finds life so so we want to as the lord would beckon to us as the lord would call out to us even y'all you need to read with uh proverbs chapter 8 uh and verses you know 23 through 31 and uh we i read this during the uh Lesson three. I, let, I read this in lesson three, but it's so good. He said that the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. Um, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the, de of the depth. When he established the clouds above. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandments. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, when, then I was by him. As one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight. God delights in wisdom. Oh, that we could. God delights with wisdom. Rejoicing always before him. Rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth. And my delights were with the sons of men. So I want to know just a little bit of what wisdom looks like. I mean, wisdom is the, is the gracious lady, Hakma, who is calling to those who are simple, calling to anyone who needs understanding, who needs wisdom. She's got a table spread. She's got her house built. And uh, let's go in there. Because if we find wisdom, then we find life. And not death. And not the gates of hell. Amen. So thank you for listening tonight to Wisdom's Image. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson. Continue reading the scripture passages that's given uh, for this lesson. And be sure and... Uh, uh, take your quiz and do it on time and make sure that you don't put it off and delay. It opens up and 10 days later it's going to close. So just a reminder, uh, I want you all, I, know, I don't want anyone to get a zero. If you're having adverse circumstances, um, you know, it happens. It does happen. Call me. Let me know. We can't just all of a sudden you say, Al the Blue said, I need you to open up for me. We're not going to do that. Uh, we want you to get your work done. We want you to get your work on time. Uh, you pace yourself and ask the Lord for wisdom. God, give me the wisdom, the time management to get all my lessons done. Amen. God bless you all. I appreciate you. Let's bow our heads. We're going to uh, dismiss uh, this lecture with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. 
Uh, Lord, I, I feel wisdom's voice. I feel wisdom reaching out to me. I feel wisdom reaching out to all of us, God. I feel the voice of wisdom. I, I feel it beckoning. Oh, God, in this hour that we live, there's so much foolishness going on. Oh, Lord, inside the church, outside the church, in the world, God, in the nation in which we live, in our state, in our communities, God, in our churches, God, we need wisdom. We ask to Almighty God, James said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. We're going to ask this whole semester and next semester. We're going to make it a priority. We're going to make it. We're it, the principal thing, God, to say, Lord, lead us in the way of wisdom. Show us the path of wisdom. Help us to fear God enough, Lord, that that then the fear of the Lord begins this walk of wisdom in us, O oh God. We fear you, Lord. We fear we've gotten away from wisdom. We fear, Lord, that we've been led by seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We feel, Lord, that we've given more into the temptation of, of the wisdom that's from beneath and that's earthly and that's sensual and that's devilish. But God, we would turn away from that voice, God. We would turn away from that worldly allurement, oh God, and temptation, Lord. And we would follow wisdom to her house and follow wisdom to her table and eat the bread and drink the wine that wisdom would offer us, oh God. Fill our soul and fill our being, oh God, with the way of wisdom and with the fear of the Lord. We ask all of these things, God, for your glory, for the for the help and the benefit of the church of Jesus Christ, Lord, for the body of Christ. We ask for wisdom. We ask for wisdom, not just for myself, but for all those who would hear tonight, God, for all those who would hear today, God, we ask for wisdom. And we give you thanks for it, Lord. We give you praise for it, Lord. It's not our wisdom, but your wisdom, Lord, that we're seeking for, that wisdom that was with you before the world was ever brought forth, before the, the, the heavens were, were ordered and ordained and brought forth, O oh God, it's deeper than any ocean, O oh God. We ask for this wisdom, O oh God, that wisdom that was daily your delight, God. We ask for this path of wisdom and understanding, God. And show us what we need to do to get it, God, and we're going to get it. We're going to obey you in it. In Jesus' holy name we ask and pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Uh, join me again for our next lesson. And you uh, stay in the Word, stay focused, and you can get your assignments done. If you need help, reach out. We'll do our best to help you. God bless you. See you again next time.